Hey guys, welcome to the live broadcast. It's uh, good to be back. I took a couple of weeks and um, as many of you know, I was actually on vacation last week. So, uh, so here's what happened. I fully intended to do a live broadcast last week. And what happened was we were driving to uh, South Carolina with some friends and um, we we're going to spend the week uh, there at our place and come to find out, I better turn my ringer off here. Come to find out the, um, that there was going to rain and we needed to take my truck because we were taking some furniture to put in the house. So I um, had to bite the bullet and just not take my video equipment with me. Uh, I didn't want it to get wet and um, there wasn't enough room really in the cab for it. So I had to forego last week's live video. So I appreciate your understanding in that. But um, it was kind of nice having a week off, but, uh, but I'm back and um, I'm excited to be here with you guys tonight. So I um, wanted to ask you guys a question. Um, what do you think this week is going to look like for stocks? I mean, you know, we hear about the Santa Claus rally <clears throat> and I think we've seen that. I mean, the last few weeks have been really, really crazy. So what do you think this rest of this week's going to look like going into the Christmas holiday? You think it's going to be green or you think it's going to be red or do you think it's going to be pretty flat? So those are your options and uh, we will uh, kind of take a look at those. But so with all of that, I'm going to go ahead and get started with the um, with the content for tonight. Let me go ahead and get that loaded up. I'm going to share this screen. Share. Oh, yeah, there we go. I mean. Who doesn't look good against Warren Buffett? So um, let me uh, come over here. The uh, The subject of tonight is uh, unveiling winning metrics. So we're talking about winning metrics for dividend growth investors. And one of those is valuation. I know I did a, a, a live video on valuation before, but this is going to be a bit of a different angle because this is about metrics. It's about, you know, winning uh, with dividend growth investing. So we're going to talk about valuation tonight. And um, the first quote I will share with you here is, and you hear it a lot, right? Price is what you pay and value is what you get. And and Warren was exactly right with that. It, it does matter what price we pay because there is a value that's associated with that. And, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that. So just hang tight for a minute. I wanted to share, first of all, about Johnson & Johnson, and you can see that here in the chart. Johnson & Johnson, just so you know, is one of the most predictable stocks I believe that there is. It is pretty consistent in the way, and you can see this chart starts back in like 2002, 2003 timeframe. Just look at the earnings growth for Johnson & Johnson until you get to, to year 20, it is just basically steady growth every year, recession or no recession uh, until you get to 2020. And then it can, and then it picks up where it left off in 2021 and it continues to grow pretty uh, steady. So I, I look at Johnson & Johnson as one of the steadiest stocks out on the stock market. And, and I show that to you because I want you to see this, this black line is actually the price of the shares. And you'll see that, you know, somewhere along the way, it's over, uh, the price is above what the uh, actual uh, fair value is. And, and uh, just so you know, this, this fair value comes from fast graphs and it is based off of the price earnings ratio. We'll talk about all of that here in a minute. But let's assume for now that these are the, the fair values of the company. They, they, the prices then will be above, it'll be below, it'll be above, and it just moves uh, over and under that, that fair value range. And what people call that, the nerds like me, what we call that is mean reversion. Mean reversion means that if, uh, if a stock's got a long-term intrinsic value, it is going to move over and under that, but it is not going to vary uh, significantly from that because it is the value. So, uh, you know, you can see that here in Johnson & Johnson. But then I also wanted to point out this. Take a look at this. In uh, uh, Does Valuation Matter is the title of this slide. And 
uh, you'll see that in November 30th of 2018, if we had bought $10,000 worth of Johnson & Johnson on that day, as of 12-15 of 23, we would have made about 20% total return. And on an annual basis, that would equal 3.68% annual total return. So, you know, that's not terrible, but it's not great either. But, but that's not the real point. The real point is, what if we waited one month? If we waited one month and, and bought shares on January the 4th, 2019. So it's a month and a few days, right? You can see then January the 4th, 2019, the stock price on, on November 30th, it was 146.90 on January 4th, 2019, which is just 34 days later or so, the stock price was 127.83. Not a whole lot changed in the value of the company in one month, that, you know, it, it, with Johnson & Johnson, right? So the, the share price was down. And if we'd bought the same $10,000 35 days later, we would have ended up with almost 40% total return or about 6.7% annual rate of return. So basically waiting one month on Johnson & Johnson would have, been, would have doubled the, uh, the rate of return. And, and so, you know, we can argue whether 3% or 3.5% uh, or 7% is meaningful but the fact that it doubles is a big deal. So does valuation matter? I say absolutely it matters. So um, let's look at Hershey's company real quick. Hershey company, uh, you can see, was way high. I mean, look at that. 2022, they just went way high. You can see what's going on at Hershey now. It's actually reverting back to the mean. And, um, you know, how far down it goes, I don't know. But um you know, it, it has come down significantly. It's moving back to uh, where the, the profit levels of the company would take it. Let's look at one of the favorites of the market today, and that is Costco. Let's take a look at Costco. For a long time, it traded, you know, pretty close to its, its uh, fair value. And then all of a sudden here, the last three years, uh, three, maybe four, it has just skyrocketed. It is way, way above its uh, intrinsic value. So I, I would love to own Costco, but it's I just don't know that I can get the value for the price that I'm paying. And then let's look at one other here. It's Microsoft Corp. And, and I shared this one to make a specific point. And that point is this. You can look back on uh, Microsoft and it is trading pretty close to its fair value. All of a sudden it breaks away kind of like uh, Costco did. But uh, different from Costco, if we had bought in June of uh, 2019, uh, even though it was high, it was, uh, it was overvalued, right? Uh, for, according to this chart anyway, it would have been overvalued. I drew a line here to show that at some point, the earnings catch up with the price that we paid. So in this particular case, buying Microsoft overvalued, wasn't a terrible deal. It just meant that we had to wait for the earnings to catch up to it so that the value uh, would, would catch up. So with that, does valuation matter? I say a hearty, strong, yes, it matters. So what is valuation? And this is what uh, this, this session is about is what is valuation? How, you know, maybe a lot of investors are new to investing and they hear this term valuation and they hear margin of safety and, and maybe they don't know what that means. So what it is, is there are really two types of valuation. One is what we consider absolute valuation. And that means that we're calculating a value for that particular company. And um, I won't read all of that, but the examples of that are, you know, when people use a dividend discount model or when they use a discounted cash flow model, they're basically coming up with the um, cash flows they believe are going to come in from for the future. They're discounting all of that back to today's dollars, and they are expecting that the value would be X for a particular company. So then that's what they're willing to pay for it. However, there is another type, and that is relative 
valuation. Now, relative valuation is what FastGraphs uses. It uses a price earnings multiple to kind of value uh, a company. So <clears throat> I'm going to read this one because it's important that we get this. It, it, it compares the company in question to other similar companies. These methods in, involve calculating multiples and ratios, such as the price earnings ratio and comparing them to the multiples of similar companies. So, you know, you, we you hear, uh, you know, price earnings, that's the one that you hear of most, or even price to AFFO for like REITs and things like that. But there's also things like price to book, price to cash flow. So when people are valuing companies from a relative perspective, they're saying, hey, relative to other companies that are similar, this company is either more inexpensive or more expensive than the other company. It doesn't necessarily tell you whether the company is worth what you're going to pay for it. It just determines whether it's expensive or inexpensive compared to its peers. So hopefully that makes sense. I thought I'd then share some valuation examples. Now, these are from uh, Morningstar. Now, Morningstar uses uh, several different methods for coming up with valuations. That's why I like to use them. I don't believe that there's any one method that works all the time. So I like that they use a, a myriad of different approaches to get what they believe is fair value. So uh, Johnson & Johnson, and I'm gonna share the ones that I shared the fast graphs on. Uh, Johnson & Johnson says the fair value is 164. The current price is around 156. So they say they're trading at about a 5% discount. So let's move to Hershey. Hershey, they're saying the fair value is 197 and the current price is 188. So it might be time uh, for me to do a little due diligence around Hershey. It had been so expensive that I really hadn't spent that much time with it. So it might be worthwhile to take a look at, at their management team and their strategy uh, moving forward and, and also what's causing their, their decline. The, other, the next one is Costco, uh, C-O-S-T. The price, and this is as of December 13th, because I pulled these slides today, but the uh, the price uh, on December 13th was $642. I think it went up even more today. The fair value, according to Morningstar, is around 460. So they they say it is trading at about a 40% premium. Ah, man, that's, that's a lot of premium. Even if they're half wrong, it's 20%. So it, it, Costco is pretty expensive. Now, if you're DCAing in and you've got the time to wait, hoping that the earnings will catch up to it, maybe that's a, a different thing, but it's pretty expensive. Now, Microsoft is at 374 and uh, Morningstar says its value is around 370. So most of these are in a fair value range. So um, let's take a look at this. Things to keep in mind, uh, this is kind of like the uh, the so what, right? The so what? Things to keep in mind. There's no single valuation model that fits every situation. So it's important to understand that you can't just use one model and assume that it's going to work in every situation. It just does not work that way. Number two, using multiple models can produce a range of values. So if you use the dividend discount model and you use the, the uh, discounted cash flow model, then, you know, you might take those and, and then average them together and see, you know, wh what the uh, value is. Some people will do that. I, I don't particularly like that approach, but, but it is certainly an approach. Uh, then the third thing is no model can accurately predict the future. And why is that? Because nobody knows the future. We don't know what their cash flow is going to be. We can, we can make guesses and they may be educated guesses around the future, but we don't know what they're going to be. So no model can predict accurately the future. And then uh, lastly, the valuation changes over time. And I'll show an example of that. Uh, I, I think this is Parker Hannafin. I don't know if it says on here. I didn't pull enough of the, of the screen to show, but I'm pretty sure this is Parker Hannafin. And over time, you'll see that this red line moves higher. The red line is what uh, the fair value is. And so it moves higher over time. And it's important to understand that just because something is worth something today doesn't mean that they're not going to add more value in the future to make themselves more valuable. So that's, that's another thing to keep in mind. So wrap up. Is valuation complicated? Yes. Is valuation an exact science? 
No. Is valuation important? Absolutely. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, kind of end this with a quote from the late, great Charlie Munger, who says, a great business at a fair price is superior to a fair business at a great price. And I share that. I'm going to go ahead and, and take this off the screen. I share that because it's important for us to understand that getting something really cheap doesn't mean we've gotten a great value. It just means we've gotten something cheap. And sometimes when things are cheap, they're cheap for a reason. So it's important to understand as we value companies, what the value, true value, what or at least what we believe the true value really is. And, and if we're finding a good deal, that means that the rest of the market is missing something, right? We're saying it's worth more than the market is currently trading it at. And we've really got to understand why that is. So uh, it's important that we see ourselves getting, I believe, great businesses at, at uh, fair prices. Well, not necessarily fair businesses at cheap prices. So this margin of safety that, that we hear from Warren Buffett, that can be helpful. That can, that can uh, you know, we can look for a lot, you know, big high margin of safety. But at the end of the day, it means that there's something wrong and we need to understand what's wrong and whether it's in, uh, you know, systemic inside the company. And if it's a company issue, then we really got to understand whether we think they can overcome that or not. So uh, I'm going <clears> to <throat> stop doing uh, this. I'm going to stop talking about that because I could really talk about this for the whole hour. But it, uh, it it's you know, valuation is really in the eye of the beholder. So as we think about valuation, it's important to winning with dividend growth investing. It's important to know what we're paying for because price is what you pay, but value is what you get. So uh, we'll leave it there. Let's go to uh, the comments. Let's see who's on tonight. Um, all right, we got Miguel on. Miguel says, good evening, my friends. Say good evening, Miguel. It's great to have you here, buddy. Pat's on. Uh, good evening to you, Pat. I uh, got ex-dividend dad. Wow. Size of your DCA matters. <laughs> Absolutely, my friend. Um, Lucas, welcome aboard, my friend. We've got uh, Miguel. Finally, he can make a live stream. Uh, I'm so glad you're here, man. I really appreciate you joining. And uh, what do we have here? Kevin Mendoza. Wow. We got two Kevins in the house tonight. That is fantastic. Welcome. Uh, so Lucas says that he thinks the rest of this week or maybe the week in total is going to be flat. So you may be exactly right. Uh, Ex-dividend dad, great to be here. I think we will be flat until a spy dividend. Yep, that is coming soon. Uh, but yeah, I, that, that sounds like that's getting to be a pretty much a consensus. Uh, Suzuki man, 89 is in the house. Welcome, Suzuki man. Um, Miguel says he inclines more for some more upside potential. And absolutely, I'm with you on that. Uh, Kevin, oh, you got the YouTube uh, notification. That's fantastic. So this week, Pat says, will be green, red, and flat. All, all three of the above. So can you really call J&J &J the same company, Reliable? after the spinoff? That's a great question, man. So uh, we've got, uh, for those of you who may have been in a cave for the last year or so, uh, Johnson & Johnson split off uh, its uh, consumer business, really. Uh, so it kept the like the medical um, gadgets and the, uh, the drugs in one company, and it spun off the consumable stuff into a company called Kenview. So the question is, hey, you know, we're, we're looking back to 2002, 2003, and uh, is that what we should expect uh, for Johnson & Johnson moving forward? And uh, you may have a great point, ex-dividend dad, because, um, you know, when you have these drugs and this pipeline, even though the pipeline is pretty solid, doesn't mean it's going to be as consistent as before. We'll just have to see. Um but yeah, you, you've got a great point. It has been consistent. Whether it stays that way or not is, is a question. I think that may be part of what's dragging the stock price down. So no, that's a great point, my friend. 
it's a completely different company uh, and would be good to see a fast grass of cave view. Okay. Uh, well, you know, ask and you shall receive. I'm going to go ahead and pull this up. Cave view fast graphs. And I'm going to share this screen with everyone. That's the wrong one. I'm just going to share that whole window. Okay. Oops, there's no data available for this selection. That is so cool. Let's try it again. Let's see what... Uh, that is weird. There is no data available for KVU. So um, I'm sorry, my friend. I cannot show it because it is not available. So we will have to move on, but uh, it would have been fun to see that. I just don't know that there's enough history yet for them to have it. But hey, it's not there. I tried. <laughs> All right. Good evening, Jim. It's glad to have you here. Um, valuation matters, Jim. Don't invest in GE. Uh, that, that, yeah, I think uh, that was good evening, not General Electric. So, all right. We've got Greg in the house. Greg says cost and, and uh, Broadcom, AVGO are insane right now. I agree with that 100%. Um, I just lost my place here. Uh, Kevin, what are your thoughts on BWXT stock? It's on my watch list. Um, I'm going to have to look that up, my friend. I don't know. I'm not sure what that is. BWXT. It sounds familiar. BWX Technologies. So from a fast grass perspective, it uh, looks to be a little high priced at the moment. Um, you, but we do see that it uh, is pretty cyclical, looks like. From a stock perspective, it's interesting to see that it is cyclical from a price perspective. Look at how it bounces up and down. But look at its earnings. Its earnings is, are, are a lot more consistent than uh, what its stock price is. So it may be one that we need a little patience on. Uh, but anyway, uh, before we, before we kind of conclude on that, let's go to BWXT in... Uh, and uh, Morningstar, hopefully you guys can see this. I need to take myself off the screen. I need to take Kevin's comment off as well. So pardon me while I do that. And this, there we go. So maybe you can see that a little bit better. They say, oh, they don't really cover it. They don't cover it in uh, Morningstar. It's got that Q rating. So they say the fair value is around 68. I don't know. It's just quantitative. I don't know if that's if that's true or not. And then uh, let's look for um, it in uh, Simply Safe Dividends, BWXT. See what they have to say about it. They have no safety rating at all. That means they don't cover it either. So uh, let's see what they do. They, they manufacture and sell nuclear components in the U.S., Canada, and internationally. They have a government and commercial uh, designs, manufactures naval nuclear components, and the commercial must then be like electrical. Um, let's see. Nu yeah, nuclear steam generators, heat exchangers, pressure uh, vessels, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, it sounds like... Um, They've got a 16% uh, five-year Kager. That's pretty good. Let's look at some of their financial stuff. Earnings payout ratio looks pretty decent. Their earnings per share uh, has kind of been flat here recently. Well, I would want to understand that. They've been buying back shares like crazy. Their sales have been rising. Their return on invested capital continues to decline. So I would want to understand that piece of it. And... Um, uh, net debt to capital, 61%. That's a uh, pretty high debt load. Um, and their interest coverage is only 6.24. I like to see that at eight or above. So uh, it would be one, um, Kevin, that I would want to do more due diligence on. And um, I think for me, I mean, I would want to know uh, why they... 
why their uh, earnings are kind of flat when their sales have been going up, why their re return on invested capital is declining. And I would want to get a, a feel for what the management team is up to and, and what their strategy is. And um, so I, I need some more info on that. But, you know, it's not something I would jump in with both feet uh, at this point. You know, do do some due diligence on that, my friend. Let's see. We got Greg. He says he's also bummed that Jay missed out on SNA at 250. Uh, I think he, he said that I missed out on SNA, just a waiting game. Yeah, I agree. Uh, SNA went up like crazy, and uh, I didn't expect that. But, hey, I'm glad for those that were uh, investing in it because it has been a great investment for them. Cost is on a tear. I wish I owned more. I only own 0.3. So that's at least you own 0.3, Lucas. You got 0.3 more than I have. I have uh, zero, but it has been on a tear. Hey, we got somebody called Do You Know. That is great. Hey, it's great to have you in the uh, in the live stream tonight. I paid a lot of money. Government paid for classes a lot less valuable than 10 minutes of this live stream. And his name is Amin. And man, I tell you, that means a lot to me. I really appreciate uh, you saying that because... That's why I do what I do. I love to share what I've learned. And um, I mean, we're all in this together and we're all trying to do the best that we can. And what I like to do is help, you know, share what I have so that others can do well. So, man, I really appreciate that. That means a lot. So David says, uh, what do you think uh, about Chevron in this cycle? Yeah, I uh, unloaded my Chevron. Oh, gosh, it's probably been about a year ago. I mean, it went it went nuts, and uh, I, I unloaded it. Um, I saw a video from Morningstar this morning, and uh, they talked about Exxon. They did not talk about Chevron, but uh, they do believe that uh, Exxon is a uh, you know viable candidate for this for this cycle. Um, I, I don't know. I, I think I don't see a uh, real catalyst for uh, the you know gasoline uh, industry, the oil industry, uh, in the next few months here. So I, I'm not really sure that uh, there's a value there uh, for me at this point to jump back in uh, to Chevron. I do like Chevron as a company, though. I think their their uh, diversity and and all around you know the their pipelines and, and their, uh, you know, searching or whatever that's called when they where they look for oil. Um, I think all of that is just top notch. And so I do like the company Chevron. I'm just not sure it's time right now for me to jump back in to Chevron. But hey, David, great question. I'm glad you're here. X dividend dad, fast graph me an XL XYL stock, please. And so uh, that may become a new verb, a new verb to fast graph me. It's like um, email me. So I will fast graph you, my friend. X, Y, L. Let's take a look and see what it says. That is Xylem. And let me show it on the screen. And I will take your comment off so you can see more of it. Um, so yeah, there it is. It is, uh, it went way high and now it's, it's still, um, you know, from a fast grass perspective, it's still, you know, pretty, uh, pretty high up there in terms of multiples. It is at a 30, uh, times price earnings. So let's take a look at Morningstar, ZYL, uh, XYL, I mean. And, uh, let's see. So they say the fair value is 106. So it is sitting at around 110. It's a uh, fair value 106. According to uh, fast graphs, it's a little overvalued. I, I think it seems to be at a fair price, but um, I would want that to come back down a bit. Uh, if it were me, I would start looking at it around 98, somewhere in that, in that blue line of vicinity. So I don't know. That's just me, though. Okay, let's uh, get back to, where's my cursor? There you are. Okay, now we've got it. 
Yeah. So uh, X dividend death says, thanks for cry trying. I, I don't know why they don't have that. I guess it's just because there's not enough data there. Uh, that's, I don't know. So Mike in Milltown, New Jersey. Hey, not, and not only is he specific with his name, but also with his location. I think that's fantastic. It's great to have you here, Mike. Uh, if you have 100,000 cash, how would you invest it for fun? For fun. Now, now uh, for me, investing in stocks is fun. So I will go with that. I, I guess, you know, I, I, I might take some of that and actually have some real fun with it, whether it's a cruise or, uh, you know, a, a vacation of some sort. But, you know, hey, let's just say it, for grins and, and giggles, I would probably uh, um, I would probably try to decide where AI is going in the future and buy those stocks, you know, so. We know that NVIDIA is a part of that. We know that Broadcom is a part of that. We know that Microsoft is a part of that. But it, it, to me, it's kind of like the Internet. At the, when the Internet came in, there were stocks at the time that were going to benefit from it. But it was really other companies that really sprang out of that that became the real winners uh, in the Internet. I think we're going to see that also in AI. But, you know, we can only invest in who we know about at the moment. We just have to be nimble. So if I had a hundred thousand in cash just to play around with, just for fun, I think that's what I'd try to do is just try to, to pick the winners uh, in AI. I don't know. That's, that's a good question. Greg says, uh, can view probably too early, not enough data yet. I agree, Greg. I think that's exactly what happened. Miguel, any thoughts on CSL? It's been a great performer. To me, and I haven't heard anybody talking about that stock. I agree with you. I like CSL. It is on my watch list. And just so you know, the way I kind of do it is I have two lists. I have a research list. Those are companies that I look that I've seen and I'm, I'm somehow attracted to them in some way, but I haven't done enough research on them. So I put those on a research list. And then I have my watch list. And those are the stocks that I believe uh, that I've done enough research on and that when they hit the right uh, level, I will, uh, you know, consider buying them. And CSL is on my watch list. So I like CSL. Let's go ahead and pull up a fast graphs on CSL's Carlisle Industries. For those who uh, don't know, let me uh, get you guys in the, in the scene here. Okay. So Carlisle um, has has really been on a tear, and and so they they've got you know these earnings that are moving around, and you know it's really hard to nail a value when things are so erratic like this. But uh, it is uh, it's a company that d is doing very well, they're, and the reason their price is high is because they're doing very well. So let's see what uh, what Morningstar says about them. Carlisle, they are in a fair value range. Uh, well, they actually don't cover them, so they're uh, showing them as a Q rating. So that's not very helpful. But we do have trusty, simply safe dividends. They are rated with a 99 dividend safety score. Their yield is about 1.08%. Um, payout ratio, really low. Look at this 12% five-year Kager. Um, we'll move on down, do this as quickly as I can. Earnings payout ratio is about in the 20% range. That is fantastic. Uh, earnings per share has jumped dramatically. Uh, free cash flow has jumped dramatically. Shares outstanding have come down a bit, about 20% in the last uh, 10 years or so. Uh, their total sales are, uh, they, they jumped in 22. They're, they're back down in 23 uh, return on invested capital is high around in the 20% range. And let's look at their debt. Their debt's around 43% with a decent interest coverage ratio. So uh, there's a lot to like, uh, Miguel, about, uh, let me get back to you here. There's a lot to like about Carlisle, in my opinion. So, um, yeah, I, I like them. I like them, my friend. CSL, it's uh, they have been a great performer, and I think that they are, 
uh, position for success. Oh, man, my buddy Russ. Russ Knopf with Dapper Dividends is in the house. He says, I think Warren Buffett says the lesson you really want on investing is how to value a business. Because if you don't know how to value a business, you don't know how to value a stock. Man, that is great. And uh, I know my buddy Russ has listened to, I think he's listened to all of the uh, Berkshire Hathaway annual meetings uh, for some, you know, however long uh, they're, they're available. So he is an expert in uh, Warren Buffett. So uh, that, that's, a great, uh, that's a great way to put it, my friend. I like that. I may, uh, I'm going to come back in here and uh, kind of steal this quote as my own. How does that sound? <laughs> oh, yeah. Hey, Russ, that's good. So X Dividend Dad, Kevin and I were chatting a bit about CSL lately. I think Kevin likes it. Yes, he does. He does. So um, you guys are chatting around. Yeah, you're welcome, my friend. And uh, I'm going to skip through some of these. Uh, but valuation matters. Absolutely. Let's see. Do you know, he says, uh, can you please fast graph cost? I purchased some four month puts. Okay. Well, we looked at it a little bit earlier, but uh, we will hit it one more time just for the fun of it, because that's the way we roll. This is Costco. Oh, sorry. You can't see that. Let me uh, put it on the screen for you. This is Costco's uh, fast graphs. You can see that it is a screaming high, 46.65 PE ratio, if that's, uh, you know, at a relative valuation. So, man, that, that's pretty high. It's also high from Morningstar's absolute uh, valuation. So I, I think it's pretty high right now. So um, I don't know, man. I don't know if I'd buy more. But, you know, this is the thing uh, with stock investing. Sometimes the market gets gets a mind of its own and it really doesn't matter what the valuation of a stock is. People like it and they're going to buy it. And uh, Costco and Hershey are great examples of that. But at some point, the business has to support the stock price and it might take years. But eventually, like we're seeing in Hershey, it's going to revert back to the mean. It's going to revert back to the business value that it can support. So those are my thoughts anyway. All right. So let's see. Where was I? I think that's where I was. So, yeah. Do you know? I mean, I think it's your name. So, uh, you know, there you go, my friend. I put it in red on red 36. <laughs> I didn't know we were playing roulette. Uh, but anyway, red 36 it is, my friend. So if you think you have 30 years, does the 10% overvaluation on a great company really matter to you? And, um, you know, again, a great question. I would say yes. I, I think it does, especially like we saw in, uh, in Johnson & Johnson. If I wait one month, and I'm able to double my return, then I think it absolutely matters. So, I, I mean, the only caveat I would give to that is if you are uh, DCAing, dollar cost averaging into your stocks, I would just buy them anyway. I mean, just pick what you want and, and buy them anyway. And then at the end of the day, it, it doesn't really matter. But if you're somebody who has a substantial portfolio and you're trying to pick where to move big pieces of, of dollars around, then uh, yeah, valuation, valuation matters a lot. So the only caveat I would give is DCA. I, I don't know that I would care too much about valuation with DCA. Those are just, that's just my opinion though. Greg, isn't a fair PE considered to be around 18 these days, even with SPY being around 23, a lot of things uh, seem pretty high. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I think uh, Fastgrass uses actually 15. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, take a look at this. You can see the the 15 right there. This is that uh, that orange line is a 15x, uh, and then the the blue line in Fastgrass. For those of you who don't know, 
is about it is uh, the actual over the same over that period of time. It is what the PE has been for that stock. So Costco on average over the last let's say 20 years has averaged a PE of 27. Um, and then they're saying, Hey, 15 is, is the norm. That's the uh, average. So I, I think you're right. I think a fair, is, it, but it probably really depends also on the market and, and what the future kind of brings. Let me uh, get rid of all this stuff. So uh, it's the future to me, the future value uh, that the company generates plays a part in what PE I'm willing to pay for it. So let's assume that it, there's not, you know, a lot of shenanigans going on with the profit and loss. Let's say it's pretty consistent. So if I'm, if I, if this company is growing at a, you know, 20% per year earnings per share, I'm willing to pay more PE today for that earnings growth than for a company who's growing at 2% per year. Hopefully that makes sense. So the PE for the company growing at 2% per year is going to be a lot lower than that one that's growing at 20. So there's a lot of factors when you're talking about this relative uh, growth. There's a lot of factors in that. But that's kind of the way I look at it, Greg. Hey, David, uh, do you think the dividend is safe with Pfizer? Well, um, I, I think so. But uh, let's take a look. Let's go uh, to over and see what Simply Safe Dividend says uh, about Pfizer. That's PFE, I think. PFE. Pfizer. 75. So they say it's safe. It's not, uh, you know, very safe, but it is safe. Man, they've got a 6%. I don't know why I didn't notice that, but they've got a 6% dividend yield. Um. Their uh, dividend safety has not changed since looks like 2020 at least. They've got, uh, you know, uh, well, they're, they've got a 5% uh, CAGR over five years. They've been paying for about 12 years. It looks like they've been paying for a lot longer than that. So I'm not really sure what what is up with that. It says the uninterrupted dividend streak is 12 years. But uh, 2022 to 2003 is a lot longer than 12 years. Sometimes uh, you just got to do your own research. These apps are only as good as the data that they have. So when you get data that doesn't make sense, you got to look it up. There's just no, uh, no way around that. So, man, the dividend has, has shot up. That's really interesting. They've got an, oh, an earnings payout ratio coming in the next 12 months at 112 percent. Um, they must have had and I don't follow Pfizer, but they must have had some issue. Uh, they're saying that the earnings in the next 12 months are going to really take a tank. And then uh, then their cash flow in the last 12 months is 112 percent. So I'm not really sure what's going on there. Yeah, things aren't aren't uh, looking so good, at least from the financials. Return on invested capital is down to five percent. Interest coverage is down to four. So, yeah, I would um, I would need to do a lot more research uh, if I were going to invest in Pfizer right now. So it's not something that really interests me, if if that makes any sense. Jim says uh, I like Morningstar's ability. Let me get this stuff off the screen here. I like Morningstar's ability to create different watch lists. Um, I've got an actual watch list plus a different watch list for holdings for uh, per month ready to go X dividend. Hey, that's pretty cool. I, I like that idea. Um, let me show you guys what he's talking about. Uh, I have, you know, my portfolio is in here. And uh, in, in this box, oops, you can't see that until I actually show it to you. So in... I'll get myself off the screen so you can see it. I'll get Jim off too. There we go. So uh, you can see in this particular box right here are the, um, I have my portfolio in here. Then I have these watch lists. So benchmarks are, are things I 
compare my portfolio with. But remember earlier where I said I had a research list and a watch list. So I had the research list here. And that is, uh, you know, these four uh, companies here. And then I have a watch list. And um, I don't know why CSL is not on there because it should be. But anyway, that's uh, that's kind of how uh, Morningstar is set up. So when I can, when every day I can look and see, you know, what's going on in my portfolio. And I can see that today I, ha I was up basically 0.1%. Percent uh, on the day, it's made a you know a bunch of changes here, but uh, overall it was pretty flat. So and and hey, here's what's really cool, guys. For the week, uh, which would include today, uh, we're up 2.75 percent. For the month, we're up 5.55. Year to date, up 16.62 percent. I'll take that, my friends. That is a pretty decent year. So I'm you know pretty happy. Pretty happy with that. Let's see, where do we leave off here? I think this is it. I have an AM on my second trip around going back to 1994. Oh, I have an M on my second trip around going back to 1994. Um, I don't I don't remember what that was about, Russ. Oh, oh, I got you. This was on the Warren Buffett's uh, uh, annual meetings. So he has gone through all of those and he's going back through again. He just cannot get enough. And uh, that's what I like about my buddy, Russ. He is a continual learner. And, you know, just to kind of step back and get philosophical for a second, that is important when you're going to be an, an investor of any kind but specifically about dividend growth investing is you always need to be learning something. And um, I, I don't know. So that's one of the things that impresses me about Russ is how much he uh, stays in the game. He's continually learning and he's continually sharing what he learns. And so it's, it's fantastic to be associated with him. So the cost won't revert back until the ex dividend of the $15 special dividend. Um, yeah, that's that's right. And then, and I think we're talking about uh, the uh, uh, Costco. For those that don't know, Costco issued a special dividend of fifteen dollars and um, which is a pretty sizable uh, dividend. Um, and, and, and as you know, that on the ex dividend date of that uh, special dividend, the stock price will will come down by fifteen dollars. But it's it's um, my view that even with that over time, that will actually uh, kind of smooth itself out. So I, I don't know, man, that's a that's a high dividend. So if you got cost or Costco and you got that big dividend, fantastic. So uh, X dividend dad says PFE spinoff. So there must be some spinoffs there. I just don't follow them uh, enough. But uh, man, is that uh, they, they don't look very good to me. <laughs> All right. The silly stock market may be bidding up cost 50 plus dollars just to get the 15th special dividend. You may be right, Russ. I mean, the, it has gone nuts. It has gone crazy. The ex-dividend dad says he thinks it's 100 percent. Is it a great time to short cost? I don't know, man. I, I mean, this could go on for years. So I don't know that I would want to get in the uh, short selling uh, arena with Costco. Uh, Russ says he may be in a cult. Um, yes, the Warren Buffett cult. I, I think that's right, my friend. Okay, let's see. Miguel, another of my great performers that nobody talks about is BR. Could you show the simple safe dividend on that one? Sorry for bothering you, but I don't have that subscription. No worries, my friend. That's why we're here. This is what we do. So uh, BR, as uh, those of you that, uh, I don't know how many of you have uh, this much age on you, but uh, maybe you remember Hee Haw. I remember watching it as a kid. And one of the uh, guys on there had his phone number and it was BR549. So I think we'll remember that it was BR. Uh, Broadridge Financial Solutions. 
Let me uh, go ahead and put this up. So Broadridge, 75 dividend safety score, got a 1.63% yield. Uh, let's, let's take a look at some of the metrics here. Their, their payout ratio looks fine. I like that dividend growth track. That looks pretty neat. They've got a 15% five-year CAGR, which is good. Let's take a look at uh, some of their metrics. So we already talked about that. Their cash flow looks fine. Earnings are growing up and to the right. Free cash is uh, growing. That's good. Shares outstanding. I moved down a little bit, but not much uh, since 2019. Uh, sales are growing like crazy. Uh, return on equity is is good. Return on invested capital is about 16%. That's a, a nice number. Um, net debt to capital, 64%. So that's pretty high. Uh, but and, and their interest coverage is only 6.56. I like to see that around eight. So uh, that'd be the only thing I would be concerned about. But it may be that they, um, you know, have maybe they've done a uh, uh, merger or something along those lines. But the uh, dividend safety is around 75, uh, my friend. So, yeah, I, th I think it's good. Let me uh, take a look and see what have they done. I'm going to look at uh, BR to see what their price movement has been. And, yeah, you're right. They have really been skyrocketing as well. So, yeah, that's uh, looks looks good to me, man. I don't know anything about the business, though. I don't know... Uh, even what they do. I'm sure they're financial in some sort and have solutions for some financial issues. I'm not exactly sure what those are. All right, let's see here. Do you think ENPH, I think that's in phase, is undervalued since it's an interest adverse or adverse stock? Um, that's a good question. Let me take a look and see what Morningstar says about that. Um, they may not cover it. Yeah, in phase energy. Well, they actually, they do cover it. They've got a fair value of $75. So from Morningstar's perspective, they say that it is about 65% overvalued. So, yeah, I don't know. Um, I don't know, man. I would, uh, I would be a little bit cautious of that one. And again, it's not one that I follow, but but according to them, it is way overvalued. Let's see what uh, is going on here in uh, Simply Safe Dividends. Oh, and they don't cover it uh, at all. So, oh, it looks like they don't even pay a dividend. So that's why they don't cover it, which makes sense. So is it undervalued? I don't think so. I think it might be actually overvalued let's see the problem with options is you have to be correct on both direction and time very difficult to continually do that is correct um you know it's it, you have to be correct as as russ says on both the direction that the stock's going to move and the time frame by which it's going to move so uh, i think um I think it was Miguel that had talked about some uh, puts earlier. And um, I don't remember, uh, I think it was a four month time period. So yeah, exactly. I mean, it, that means that it has to go the direction you think and it has to do it in the time that you think. Uh, otherwise it was just a, um, just an exercise. So options are uh, really kind of, um, they take a lot of time. Uh, for me, I tried options at one one time. I was going to, um, you know, have this options portfolio, and I spent, you know, several months uh, just digging into options, learning about options, and ended up having, uh, you know, and I retired because I wanted to do what I wanted to do, but yet options were causing me to be looking at my terminal every day, following the stocks and following these option prices. So, you know, it caused me to not um, uh, delve into options anymore just because of the time it took me to uh, to kind of maintain to, for the care and feeding of my options portfolio. It, it took a lot of time, a lot of uh, 
a lot of effort. So uh, there is return there and it makes the yield a lot higher. But you know what? I had to pay taxes on all those gains. So uh, it, it uh, at the end of the day, wasn't as uh, lucrative to me as I thought it once was, would have been. Ex-Dividend Dad says that uh, ENPH has peaked. You may be right, my friend. Alpha Spread says uh, ENPH is 3% undervalued. Well, that's interesting. Uh, Alpha Spread, I didn't know they did valuations like that. Uh, maybe maybe uh, that is, well, what, how much? We got like four and a half minutes left. And uh, I don't know if I can get there in time, but we'll try it. ENPH. It may be that that is the analyst projections. So let's see here. And. Yeah, I don't know if I'm going to be able to find it that quickly. It's uh, interesting. I'll go ahead and show you guys what I'm seeing here. I'll take Greg off the screen. It says uh, ENPH is a high risk of performing badly. That's, uh, that's the understatement, I think. But um, what I was looking for is uh, there is typically, maybe it's here. Yeah, Wall Street analysts. And uh, this is one thing that I used to look at. So they say that uh, average price target is around 114. So, uh, but I don't know where they, they have a, a valuation. So um, I, I think... I'm not aware that uh, see, uh, Seeking Alpha has a valuation. So you may have to help me with that, uh, Miguel. Maybe you can send me a note uh, on that. Is it Miguel? Oh, no, it's Greg. So, Greg, maybe you can uh, shoot me a, a note, or uh, I don't know if you're in my uh, Instagram. You can DM me there, or if you're on, the, uh, if you're on Ryan's uh, Discord group, send me a note there as well. And uh, kind of helped me find that uh, valuation in uh, alpha, oh, alpha spread, not seeking alpha. Sorry, dude. I, uh, I, you know, when it's live like this and you kind of bumble and you fumble, um, it, it's like there for everybody to see. And I just fumbled that. I read that as seeking alpha and it's alpha spread. So I, I get you, man. Uh, alpha spread is um, alpha spread takes both relative and absolute and averages them together. So maybe that's, that's what it is. But like we mentioned early in the broadcast, it is, or it's more of a range than it is an exact number. So, uh, but it's really weird that ENPH would be so overvalued in one. And so, and then slightly undervalued in another, that's pretty, pretty weird. So yeah, I don't know. Sorry about that, man. I just kind of hosed that up. Hey, Cookie Monster, I uh, was thinking about you today. I saw your name on my feed, and uh, I thought, man, I haven't seen Cookie Monster in a while. So, dude, it is really good to have you in the broadcast tonight. So uh, does anyone have an opinion on J-K-H-Y? Well, I don't know. Let's go see if we can form an opinion on JKHY. I'm not even sure what it is. So let's go to Fastgrass first. JKHY. Henry Jack and Associates. I think I saw something on that today. Um, maybe from Ari Goodman. Um, looks to be a little bit uh, overvalued here. Let's, let's swing over really quick. JKHY. Got a 99 uh, dividend safety score, uh, 1.25% yield. Let's see how fast that's growing. It's only growing about 8% per year. However, it is growing pretty consistently. So it's got that. It's got a 33-year uh, growth streak as well as uh, it's uh, uninterrupted for 33 years. So, man, I, one thing I would look at is this uh, free cash flow payout ratio. 
they're uh, for whatever reason their free cash flow payout ratio has jumped dramatically their earnings payout payout ratio did not that means that there must be something going on that they are um let me come back on the screen for a minute because this is important to understand Companies will issue earnings and they will normalize those earnings, meaning that they want to tear out anything that is not something that you should consider moving forward for the company. So, uh, you know, normalized earnings will have some of the one time bad things and one time good things as well. But a lot of times they'll try to figure out how to get those in the regular earnings, but they will they will have that. Uh, kind of stripped out of their earnings number. But you know, free cash flow is free cash flow. It is a cash flow statement, not a thing in the world they can do about that. So there's something going on in the company that they are excluding from their earnings, but it is being captured in their free cash flow. I, my friend, would want to know what that is before I dumped cash into Jack Henry and Associates. So, you know, maybe that's helpful. Uh, but it is a caution I would give on this particular stock. Um, okay, let me come back to this. And uh, just a couple more things. Uh, return on invested capital looks good. Their debt level looks fantastic. They've got a 26 interest coverage ratio. So that looks really good. Um, so, yeah, I think for me... Um, let me see who uh, asked that. Oh, that was Cookie Monster. So yeah, Cookie uh, Cookie Monster. Um, I would I would want to know what that. Uh, I forget. That. I'm trying to think of the. Oh, I think they call them special items. So if you go into their 10 Qs or 10 Ks and do a query on special items. It should take you to those and, and take a look at what those things are. And if you're comfortable with them, then by all means, you know, carry forward. But it's something that I would want to look at if I were investing you know, in that company. Hopefully that's helpful. It may be just that I'm a nerd and I like that kind of stuff. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Uh, it's good to double check sources, especially when uh, the the sources are quantitative, and and they're basically you know taking a lot of data and they're just doing an algorithm on it. They're not really uh, you know a person that's actually deciding you know how to to measure different things. So I think Alpha Spread is quantitative, uh, whereas Morningstar has more of the human element in it, and that's one of the reasons I like. Uh, morning star. So Miguel says, not me. I tried options a long time ago, but I didn't like it. I prefer stocks. I'm, I'm with you, my friend. Uh, that is exactly the way I look at it. Cheers, everyone. It must be, uh, make sure to leave a thumbs up. Hey, thanks for us. I appreciate that. And, uh, you know, that would be awesome if you guys would give this video a thumbs up. It'll let people know that it's worthwhile content. So I appreciate that. Uh, Greg says, I just did a quick look. No biggie. Um, let's, uh, yes, let's go to smash that like button. Thank you, Kevin. I appreciate very much your teaching and the way you conduct the live stream. I really appreciate you guys being here. And uh, Miguel, you are a uh, gentleman's gentleman. So uh, Pat says, thanks for the live stream. Anybody but anything, anybody, oh, anybody buy anything. Sorry, let me put it up on the screen. Anybody buy anything this week? I bought PFE, so I bought Pfizer, uh, Realty Income, McDonald's, RC. I'm not sure who, who that is, and Verizon. So um, I didn't buy anything this week. Uh, I did buy some things last week right after the Fed announcement came out. I went in and bought some, actually some ETFs, and I'll probably put that in my next video. Uh, but yeah, it'd be... Uh, you know, maybe um, maybe one of these live broadcasts will just kind of go through my portfolio if uh, you guys would want to do that, if that would be of interest to you. So, um, all right, guys. Oh, wow. We are over. It is a one hour and four minutes. 
I appreciate you guys being here. Thank you all. I uh, really appreciate this community. It is really fun to do these live streams. Now that I've kind of gotten into the, the rhythm and I am ex I'm just excited to be here. So uh, with that, I'm going to sign off and I will see you on the next video. Take care, everybody.